Uh, but uh, I want to thank you everyone for being here for the third webinar in our 2021 webinar series hosted by the Ozark chapter of Wild Ones. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, afterwards, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So make sure you go check out our YouTube channel. You'll be able to see all of our webinars on there. Uh, Wild Ones, Native Plants, Natural Landscapes. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that promotes environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. Uh, if you want to join our chapter or a chapter near you, if you're located elsewhere other than Northwest Arkansas, you can go to wildones.org slash membership. Uh, you can also find out more information uh, about our chapter by going to our chapter website at ozark.wildones.org. Uh, check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash ozarkwildones or contact us via email at wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com. Just want to briefly mention uh, our next two webinars we have coming up on Wednesday, June 9th at one o'clock. We have uh, Ryan Denier from Quail Forever. Uh, he is going to be doing a program for us on Quail Forever in Arkansas, Native Ecosystem Restor Restoration for Thriving Quail Populations. And then on Wednesday, July 14th at 11 a.m., uh, Jay Randolph will be doing a program for us on Mastered Prairie Restoration about a project that he's been doing with restoring uh, a uh, good sections of the uh, golf course down there in Fort Smith that he manages back to the native prairie that it used to be. Our speaker this month is Nate Weston of the Beaver Watershed Alliance. Uh, Nate has been with the Alliance for four years. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from the University of Central Arkansas and Associates of Arts from the University of Arkansas Community College in Moralton. Uh, Nate worked as a restoration assistant for the Jewel Moore Nature Reserve during his undergraduate years. Uh, and later interned under ecologist Theo Witzel uh, with the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. Uh, Nate was later hired as a research assistant uh, with the Natural Heritage Commission after completing his internship. Uh, and he assisted in the herbarium and field surveys uh, looking for rare plants. Uh, Nate now lives in Fayetteville with his husband, Patrick, uh, enjoys camping, hiking, and gaming, and is passionate about native plants, biogeography, and ecological restoration. Uh, to Nate, today, Nate will be talking to us about riparian management for landowners. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nate and uh, let him take it from here. Yeah, how's everyone doing? Uh, my name is Nate Weston, as Eric said, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, riparian areas as well as kind of a holistic view going from watersheds down to uh, riparian areas, talking about some, some fluvial geomorphology, which we'll kind of discuss a little bit later. Um, I've got a lot of content to cover, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, so I work for the Beaver Watershed Alliance, and our mission is to proactively protect, enhance, and sustain the water quality of Beaver Lake and the integrity of its watershed. We do that primarily through education, outreach, uh, technical assistance, and best management practices, and uh, planning and analysis. And like I said, we'll be covering uh, watersheds, uh, human dependence on the watershed, especially in the Beaver Lake watershed, uh, risks to watershed vitality, uh, fluvial geomorphology, which I'll define later, and primarily water uh, riparian zones. What are they? Uh, how to recognize if they're healthy, unhealthy, riparian management, uh, challenges to riparian areas, and the importance of riparian zones, and some common native and exotic species that you'll find in those areas. So what is a watershed? Well, watershed is defined, there's many different def definitions, but probably the one I like the most is uh, an area of land draining all the streams and rainfall to a common outlet such as a reservoir, mouth of a bay, any point along the stream channel. <clears throat> there are many watersheds in the United States, and uh, this is a color-coded map of them. Uh, the area circled is the watershed in which I work, which is the Beaver Lake watershed in northwest Arkansas. It's part of the uh, Upper White River watershed, which drains in the, into the Mississippi, um, about halfway between the town of Dumas and city of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we have several me metropolitan areas in the Upper White River watershed and the Beaver Lake watershed, Rogers, Springdale, and Fayetteville. Like I say, this whole, this whole watershed drains into the Mississippi. Uh, we have several counties. Uh, several municipalities. Uh, I'm just going to skim through all this because we got a lot of content to cover. Um, <clears throat> 2,800 square mile or 2,800 uh, miles of streams. 
Um, our watershed fuels uh, Beaver Lake, which is the primary drinking source for one in six Arkansans. Uh, many places from eastern Oklahoma all the way to Harrison, Arkansas. <clears throat> and as we see here on this map, uh, water is pulled from Beaver Lake and goes to several places in northwest Arkansas, Oklahoma, southern Missouri, and north central Arkansas. Uh, providing drinking water to about 500,000 Arkansans, or one in six. Uh, recreation and uh, electricity generation. Um, one of the main factors that we're seeing is uh, urban sprawl and the introduction of um, impervious surfaces such as concrete parking lots, pavements, rooftops, and uh, one that's not really recognized as much is um, when new housing developments are put in, uh, layers of clay that are put down over the ground that prevent water from infiltrating down into the soil and contributing to the volume going into streams. <clears throat> Uh, we talk about impervious surfaces quite a bit, and uh, basically that determines how much water is going to go into a stream as it flows over a landscape. Is that water going to be soaked in or infiltrated into the soil, or will it go off into the stream and contribute to the volume of water going into the, into the stream and waterway? Um, that's a major management concern, consideration because sediment is the number one pollutant to Beaver Lake, uh, and it comes from construction sites primarily from stream bank erosion, unpaved roads, and sometimes agricultural runoff. Um, that sediment can be a problem because uh, sedimentation and uh, the excess nutrients which come along with it can uh, cause algal blooms, sometimes toxic or harmful algal blooms. Uh, the Beaver, Lake, Beaver Watershed Alliance has worked with several partners to develop a, uh, the Beaver Lake Watershed Protection Strategy to address some of the concerns of maintaining long-term drinking water quality in Beaver Lake and uh, fueling the continued growth in the region. Um, plans to restore water quality of impaired streams and lake areas as part of the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, uh, list of impaired waterways and mostly minimize additional costs and potential regulations for people living and working in the watershed. <clears throat> Some priority watersheds, like I said, I'm going to skim through this. Uh, this is the, fast, the 14th fastest growing region in the United States, and so we had about 32 people per day. Um, this is outdated data based on the 2010 census, and so we're looking forward to seeing what the data is for, for the 2020 census. Um, I talked about geo, fluvial geomorphology earlier. It's a mouthful, and basically it, it means the study of a river form and function, um, pretty much how a stream interacts with the landscape and uh, how that stream changes over time. Fluvial meaning water, geomorphology means land change, so how the water uh, both interacts, changes, and is changed by the land. Um, the three major things that streams do is uh, they pick up sediment in the form of erosion, and they deposit that sediment on the sides or they put down, and sometimes they transport that sediment downstream and that's kind of like picking up, putting down, and carrying off material that enters the waterway. Uh, what affects that runoff? Several things can affect it. The contributing area of the watershed or the catchment area, topography such as slope, the drainage pattern, geology, soil, uh, land use that we talked about a little bit earlier, and uh, climate hydrology, how much is going in in terms of water and uh, how much of it is being filtered out, so input, output. Um, some key features with uh, watersheds and streams in our area that affect riparian areas are we, in the Ozarks, we have steep slopes, and those steep slopes uh, cause streams to be fairly flashy. So when it storms, a lot of water is entering those streams in a very short amount of time, and it causes them to reach flood stage or uh, high volumes of water and high velocities in a relatively short amount of time compared to flatter areas. We also have uh, very porous karst geology that's uh, primarily defined by limestone or calcareous um, uh, parent material. And uh, that's porous and so springs and seeps uh, transport, store that water. Our watershed's primarily 70% forest and 21% pasture. So that factors in as well. Um, so there's a concept in fluvial geomorphology called um, dynamic equilibrium. Uh, riparian areas will factor in very much with this, and basically it's a very fancy way of saying 
a stream always wants to maintain a balance and when it's out of that balance it will always seek to reestablish it and as it's doing so it will um, erode stream banks it will widen out and we'll see a little bit of that in the future <clears throat> this is a uh, really good diagram that shows that and so this is kind of what you'd see on a stream in the riparian area adjacent to it so we're going to stop we're going to start up here at the top center and this is a, a very stable stream in dynamic equilibrium basically this says that when water is flowing down the stream it can spread out when there's too much volume and uh, maintain a fairly stable pattern um, in a smaller stream that not is not in that stable state though it will start to erode down into the channel and start fanning outward in a, in a process called incising, just like the incisors of your teeth. It tends to chew at the sides and at the bottom and causes uh, collapses of, of sediment and uh, stream side material into the stream. And uh, as it does that, it starts widening out. And then it starts doing what's called a grading and then it starts depositing material on the sides of the stream and flattening out and so you wind up with this much broader uh, shower channel that becomes a little bit more stable but it still hasn't reached that final stable state of dynamic equilibrium um, and we see this in a diagram up in the top left and that uh, incising is is shown in the top right the water tends to undercut the bank and causes a series of collapses of the stream bank and uh, as the stream is, is widening out and attempting to reach that, that stable equilibrium. Um, streams over time as they do this, they create several terraces that we'll see along the sides of the stream. And these are usually indicators of, of uh, riparian areas below that and places the stream has, has flooded and has reached in the past. Um, streams usually have a pretty well-defined floodplain and it's usually on the insides of those terraces. You'll usually see a valley on either side of the stream with that floodplain in the in between the two val in between the two um, terraces. And typically, what that means is this is an area where it's kind of an excess capacity for the stream. So as a, as the stream is maintaining its channel, when a storm event occurs, the stream comes out of that channel, floods its banks, and then occupies that floodplain area. <clears throat> and uh, that's very important for uh, spreading out the water and slowing it down. Um, so up here on the top, if you have a stream that, say, has been channelized and a stream that has managed for rapid flow, then what happens is all that water gets sucked out and the negative pressure of that water actually draws water out of the ground and transports that water out of the water table downstream. So it, or excuse me, I have these, I have that label backwards. Increased flow should be on the bottom. Um, so if you have a, a stream that is, has a slower flow, you're gonna have a higher water table, more groundwater infiltration and higher water storage. And again, the, that uh, decreased flow should be on the top, increased flow should be on the bottom. I have that backwards. Um, so in an increased flow stream, you're going to have shallower water table, uh, less riparian vegetation, and uh, more, more potential for flooding as there's less groundwater storage. I have a pretty good video here. This was taken at Lake Atlanta in Rogers. And uh, this is a, a little spot where you can see the groundwater seeping through the ground as it's being infiltrated. And uh, you can see that gravel layer down there. And you see how crystal clear this water is. So this is storm water that has been efficiently filtrated. It's very clean. All the sediment has been removed. All the excess nutrients have been removed. And uh, <clears throat> when streams do flood, or as, as I was mentioning earlier, they do occupy that floodplain um, in areas in urban areas, often those floodplains are managed as uh, green spaces, such as parks, things like that. This is the Town Branch Trail in Fayetteville, and as we can see, that stream has the Town Branch stream has come up, flooded, and it's now occupying its floodplain. And we see the terraces uh, over there on the right. Um, this is a major problem we have in uh, in our watershed and many others is just as a stream is trying to retain that dynamic e equilibrium. Um, the force of the water 
the water itself simply has more force in it. And uh, because there's more water, more volume, and it's moving faster. And there's less water being pulled out of that stream into the groundwater. And sometimes more contribution from runoff. So you have more water, more volume, and more force. And that force is exerting itself on the banks of streams. And uh, in cases like this, we'll see um, erosion like we well, like we have here. And this is simply a stream that's that's trying to reestablish its meander, trying to reestablish that equilibrium like we were talking about earlier. And uh, here's a great video we came across. So this is going to be a stream as it is a channelized stream. We're going to see it try to reestablish that equilibrium. You'll see how it starts to form the, the S pattern. And this is just centrifugal force in the water itself as it's hitting one stream bank, it's reflected or deflected, goes to the opposite stream bank, gets deflected, and it bounces back and forth like this until all the force from the water is, is exerted and it reaches that state of equilibrium. And uh, this was just on a water table, but we'll see this in, you'll see this in, in, in every stream. Um, streams do this a lot. Uh, this map on the left is from Harold Fisk's meander maps of the Mississippi River, which was uh, done in 1944. And what Harold Fisk did, did was he color coded every meander that was determined for the Mississippi River at that time, 1944. And you see just how much the Mississippi River has moved and uh, flipped and flopped back and forth as it's maintained that, that state of equilibrium. Um, this is a much more powerful stream than a lot of the headwater streams that we, we would see. So there's much more potential for this stream to move and, uh, and interact with the stream banks. And uh, if there are any changes, then there's much more force as, this, as the Mississippi River is trying to retain that, regain that equilibrium. <laughs> you can also see it on, expressed uh, through government land office maps which I've superimposed here on top of a satellite image. Uh, you'll see the current channel up on the top with a red arrow pointing to it. And then you'll see the previous channel. And I forget the date of this map. I think this was taken in the late 1800s or possibly early 1900s. And uh, you can see this is near Elkins, Arkansas, of just, just how the, uh, middle fork of the West, middle fork of the White River has moved in that time. So what is a riparian area? This is when we really get into to this topic. Um, so riparian area is most commonly defined as an intentionally as a uh, an area that's intentionally incorporated into the nearby stream and allows stormwater runoff to have a place to be to be slowed down and impeded before it enters the stream. Uh, there's several different types of riparian buffers. Um, so most of many of them are variable width, and uh, this is just if a stream is wider, then the buffer can be wider. Um, fixed zones. Some riparian buffers are just determined to be 50 feet, and they will be 50 feet uh, on the sides of the stream on either side, regardless of any environmental factors um, such as slope. Um, things like that, whereas variable width takes into account slope, terrain, features, things like that. Um, probably the best type is called the three zone, and that's a tiered system of trees, shrubs, and herbaceous flora. So you would usually see taller trees around the stream bed itself, and then shrubbery uh, between the trees and a open area of grasses and forbs. This is, this allows a <clears throat> very good thorough uh, filter for any kind of sediment or contaminant that would enter the stream. So what does an unhealthy riparian area look like? Well, we see several things that could impact a riparian area. Um, you might see few trees 
And uh, those trees may or may not be supported by grasses and forbs that are going to have those really fine roots that are going to really hold the soil in place. Um, as we see down here on the bottom left, trees are great, but if if the only thing growing around the riparian area are just trees, then you're not going to have good fibrous root systems that are going to really hold that soil in place. And event, most often those trees will succumb to erosion and collapse into the stream. And we see that pretty regularly. Um, it's a general misconception that all you need are trees. So you really need that healthy dynamic mix of trees and, and smaller vegetation. Um, Contentious topic is livestock access to stream um, can be really problematic. Uh, livestock are big animals, and if they are routinely going down into the stream, uh, wallowing, wading, then as they go up and down the stream banks, they can cause a tremendous amount of, of erosion and disturbance. Whereas if they are restricted or only allowed to go into the stream to drink and then discouraged through uh, various structures, um, then those that would be much better for the stream. Mowing down to the waterline is also a very bad thing because it removes that, that uh, beneficial vegetation and encourages a smaller shallower rooted vegetation, can even replace the beneficial vegetation with exotic species that would be much, much shorter rooted. Um, short grasses in monoculture are also bad, so things like Bermuda grass um, that's not going to have good root structures to hold that soil in place and uh, minimal <clears throat> and uh, small fibrous roots. Um, so you really want that, that deep rooted fibrous vegetation that's going to hold the soil. Um, a healthy riparian area is going to look kind of like this. This was taken along the West Fork of the White River near a uh, a restoration area that the Watershed Conservation Resource Center did. And you see lots of forbs, these nice bright green vegetation in the front here. And we got grasses behind those and mixed in. Got a good stand of shrubs. I think these are pawpaws. And then we have tall, healthy trees. Most of these are mature oaks and some cottonwoods, I believe. Um, we'll see some stream bank stabilizations. Um, basically, a stream bank stabilization is when you have a heavily incised stream, you want to stabilize it so you can uh, reintroduce vegetation and give it time to establish those roots. Um, a lot of times what we see is two forms that are either bioengineering or what we call hard engineering. And, and a couple examples of bioengineering are terrace planting area over tow wood. And uh, toe wood is basically a tree that has often fallen in a storm or been removed and uh, has been repurposed um, to plant along to dig down and uh, reinforce these restor restoration areas to give the stream a hard surface with which to interact. And above that toe wood, you have these terraced plantings of, of uh, plants that are reinforced by, by fiber mats. Um, you might also see uh, large stones laid down uh, along curves like we see at the uh, Squirrel Creek tributary in, Win in uh, Winslow. And that gives that water a hard surface and a, a dense object to, to exert that force on. So it's not exerting that force on erodible material like the sides of the stream bank. You might also see the hard engineering like uh, riprap is very common in many places or stone gabions. And this stone gabions are basically just cobblestones that are that are inside a, a metal cage. <clears throat> um, there are some other practices. We really don't see these around here. You mostly see them up north and out west. Um, you might see bank attached post assisted log structures or PALs. And basically these are wooden posts which are driven into the stream. And uh, they might have some some smaller uh, material wed, uh, weaved through them or woven through them like uh, willow strands, willow whips. They might be in the middle of the channel or they might be off to the side. And uh, these are basically just to slow the water down, spread it out and encourage that water interaction with, with the floodplain and encourage that groundwater uptake, groundwater recharge. Um, one thing that the Beaver Watershed Alliance also highly encourages is the establishment of riparian areas through plantings. 
And uh, so this is going to increase the amount of vegetation on the sides of stream banks and uh, help in, in reinforcing those channels. And uh, vegetation is very important, as I've been talking about. And this is a wonderful video, kind of demonstrates that in a real world situation. Or not real world, this is a simulation. But um, so what we see here is we see a, ve a simulated vegetation area on the left with a good riparian area. And then on the right, we do not. Uh, those pulses are die. Uh, so you can get a better idea what what the stream is looking like and then we have a increase in the velocity simulating a flood we see that vegetated area stabilizes itself pretty rapidly there's some minor erosion but overall it it maintains itself pretty well we see how washed out this area on the right becomes because there's nothing holding that that sediment in place <clears throat> And over time, you see the creation of a delta and a, just a complete washout. And this is exactly what happens in, um, in channelized streams, too, in streams without good riparian areas. Um, another factor that uh, to, to managing riparian areas is uh, invasive species. Um, green is not always good. And uh, one of the major problems we have in Arkansas is fruiting understory shrubs like bush honeysuckle, Chinese privet, and uh, a few others, mostly those two. Um, Nandina can sometimes invade and uh, burning bush. But typically when you see this wall of green along stream banks in early spring, that's typically not a good thing because that's an invasive species. And uh, what that invasive species does is it will choke out understory vegetation and it will not establish a good root structure and uh, despite all that greenery above, you have very poor uh, surface soil uh, retention. So these areas are highly prone to, to runoff and uh, erosion. Um, we do, the Beaver Watershed Alliance does several invasive species, invasive plant, plant removals, um, like we've seen here at Mount Sequoia Woods. Uh, we moved several invasive species uh, and 97 acres of open woodlands or urban woodlands in Fayetteville. And uh, here on the left picture, in the before picture, we see the bush honeysuckle as we've just removed it. You see very little vegetation in that spot on the bottom left. Um, this picture was taken in April. So this is the height of spring. There should be <clears throat> grasses and wildflowers and things like that emerging here. But that really dense stand of understory uh, fruiting invasive plants have, have pretty much prevented that. Uh, on the right, this was a, a one-year follow-up to an area that we'd treated, and we see stands of wildflowers and grasses and uh, beneficial vegetation coming up. And that's going to filter that stormwater and increase biodiversity and several things. Um, <clears throat> One challenge that we see with riparian areas is when they're unmanaged and they have a lot of invasive species or, or they have what are called occluded canopies or closed canopies. Um, a typical sign of a occluded or closed canopy is the forest floor is, it looks dark and brooding. You see very little uh, grass and herbaceous vegetation. Um, oftentimes you'll see these small stunted twisted seedlings Typically what that means is all that vegetation is competing for sunlight, which is very limited, and uh, it stunts their growth, and they tend to adopt atypical growth patterns, trying to reach what little light they can. Um, that's wonderful habitat for vines, which is not necessarily a good thing, and uh, so you'll see vines like bittersweet, um, sometimes uh, Jap often Japanese honeysuckle, things like that coming up. And um, those are <clears throat> those are all indicators that your understory is or your canopy is probably too dense and could use thinning. Um, these areas are highly susceptible to invasion by by exotic plants like bush honeysuckle and privet. And uh, when that occurs, it's a it's, it's kind of an unfortunate positive feedback cycle that you'll have more infestation by those unwanted uh, harmful plant species, and you'll have more the canopy will become more and more dense 
and the overall quality and uh, habitat value will diminish over time. And the area will become much more susceptible to erosion and runoff. Um, in stream along the riparian areas, we also tend to see destabilized trees. Um, it's hard to tell on the picture, but this tree is overhanging the, the stream bank. You see a large uh, root that's coming out off to the left. And um, typically we like trees. You want trees to grow uh, along and inside the stream. But this is an unfortunate situation where this tree's center of gravity is inside the stream bed. Inside the stream bed. And what happens is if you leave this tree in place, it will eventually collapse in. But when it does that, the top of the tree isn't going to be the only thing that goes in, but it's going to be the entire tree, its root wad, and everything. And uh, that's going to <clears throat> cause a destabilization in the stream bank itself. It's going to cause a cavity. And it's going to cause a point of erosion. So in cases like this, it's it's counterintuitive, but it's a it's much better for the stream to just go ahead and remove this tree um, by cutting it off at the at the top or at the roots. Um, you will lose that one tree, but you'll preserve that section of the stream bank, and uh, you'll have much less erosion following up. And we see kind of an aftermath of a case exactly like that. Um, that pocket on the right was where a single tree collapsed in the stream bank. And when it did that, it took its entire root wad with it. And so what we saw following that was a significant amount of erosion and stream bank incision. And uh, this was all due to the area above this spot having been brush hog, probably a little too close. The landowner was maintaining a straight pattern in their brush hog and was not varying depending on the natural meander of the stream itself. And so that kind of, over time, that undermined the, the roots uh, around that tree from the smaller vegetation, allowing it to become uh, impaired and eventually causing it to fall in. And so when that stream, when that tree fell in, it created this cavity, you have a lot of erosion, and every time it erodes more and more of that spot, you have a, a large uh, amount of sediment that's going to be going downstream. Um, one other thing we see a lot of is, uh, this one's kind of questionable, uh, challenges to riparian area is beavers. Um, landowners typically don't like beavers, but uh, pretty much what beavers are doing are, is they are uh, thinning, naturally thinning out that large woody vegetation, and they're opening up those, those narrow, uh, narrow streams into wider areas, and they are, they're attempting to reconnect that stream with its natural floodplain. Us humans don't necessarily like that because we may or may not want that stream to have access to its floodplain for obvious reasons. We may not want flooding in that area and we may not want, um, we just may not want water in that area due to development or anything like that. But basically a large tree like that, us humans, we like to see that. It, get, it makes us happy. But um, beavers don't necessarily like that. They like uh, smaller stem vegetation, and so what they want to do is they want to convert these larger trees into something more like this. Um, this is coppiced vegetation that has been repeatedly chewed off by beavers, and it's re-emerging, and so you have this finer stem vegetation that is much more beneficial for beavers and uh, is much more, much more uh, in tune for what they want in building structures, dams, things like that. Um, to go up here on the top left, uh, so we have a, a beaver girdled oak. What they'll do is um, the beavers are rodents, their teeth grow continuously, and so they, they have to chew um, to keep their teeth healthy. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll oftentimes go around and girdle these large trees that are too large for them to, to just chew down. Eventually the tree dies from this, and what that does is it eventually uh, thins out those larger trees, encourages smaller trees to grow, and it encourages this coppicing effect. And uh, so a lot of plants, when you cut them, they'll re-sprout from the ground and uh, in this smaller vegetation, and it's called coppicing. <clears throat> um, 
a lot of times invasive species have to be treated with a with an herbicide, uh, the stump painted, and uh, depending on the species, that's necessary. And it's to prevent this coppicing effect. Bush honeysuckle and Chinese privet are especially prone to doing this. And uh, so what those beavers do is, going back to that uh, fluvial geomorphology, is uh, so if either a beaver or a human comes in and they, they put a structure into the stream to slow that water down and spread it out, eventually what the stream does is it starts to go through the cycle of dynamic equilibrium and it will start eroding the sides. It's a temporary thing. It'll erode the sides. The beaver will come in, extend the dam, and uh, increase this uh, reestablish connectivity with the wetland, with the uh, floodplain area. You might have a storm event comes through. It might punch a hole in the dam. The beaver comes in, repairs that. And so what happens is you go from this narrow, constrained channel up here in the top left, picture A, to the one down in the bottom right, which is F, and you have much more biodiversity, uh, a much wider floodplain area, um, much more groundwater up, groundwater recharge. And uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but on, on these pictures, this thin blue line is the groundwater level. So what happens is over time, we see that groundwater level go from very, very shallow to very, or very low to very high. So you have much more groundwater storage. And uh, the effect of that <clears throat> is every time it rains, every time it storms, that flood area fills up, the floodplain fills up, and there's much more surface interaction for that flood water to percolate down into the soil and, uh, and fill up the, that soil, which, is, which acts almost like a sponge. And this doesn't necessarily have to be from beavers either. Humans can do this too. So up here in the top, you have a, a channelized stream, not channelized, but a very narrow stream, um, not really any, any connectivity to its floodplain. Um, there's the water tends to have high temperatures, which is not good for, for wildlife. Um, the groundwater has very low storage and recharge capability. Biodiversity in this area is fairly low. And uh, resilience is also fairly low. And what resilience is, is if there's a disturbance, if there is a development upstream, or if there is a flood, or, or if there's any kind of change that would disturb this ecosystem, uh, its ability to respond to that and maintain a stable state is pretty limited. Um, so it's going to be much more prone to erosion, flooding, um, Un unfortunate, undesirable consequences. Um, in the bottom, with uh, more more connectivity to its floodplain, you see higher groundwater storage and recharge, lower water temperatures, uh, more biodiversity, and it's going to be much more resilient to the, to those disturbances. <clears throat> so why are, why why are uh, riparian areas important? Well, as we talked about earlier. Mostly you're going to see reduced soil erosion. So you're going to have much more, much less rather erosion going into the stream, many, much fewer nutrients going in that are going to have to be uh, treated for water quality, treated for drinking water, um, reduced sedimentation. <clears throat> so whenever that stormwater picks up, it carries that sediment, transports that fine sediment downstream. And uh, what that sediment does is it suffocates those, uh, those stream insects, those macroinvertebrates. And a lot of times those macroinvertebrates are necessary for maintaining uh, larger wildlife like fish. So if you do not have good, a good population of stream macroinvertebrates, you do not have the population of fish on which, um, which depend on those macroinvertebrates. Um, you also are going to have much more uh, runoff, and so you're going to have much more uh, contaminants like uh, hydrocarbons, oils, paints, any, uh, runoff from roadways, construction sites, things like that. No, and of course, no one wants to see that. No one wants to see an oil slick, oil slick in their stream. Um, one that's often overlooked 
is good riparian areas also increase the dissolved oxygen concentration in water, and this is critical. Um, so as sunlight hits water, it heats up the water, and um, a, a physical law is ca uh, called Henry's Law of Solubility. It's just like, just like a soda pop. Um, if you have a soft drink that's been just been taken out from the refrigerator, it's cold, uh, you pop open the can, and it's fizzy. But if you leave that same can out sitting at room temperature for a few hours, um, it's much less fizzy. And that's just due to Henry's law of solubility, basically states that any fluid uh, has much greater capacity to hold dissolved gases in it uh, when it's colder than when it's warmer. And water is the same way. Uh, that dissolved oxygen is necessary for fish and macroinvertebrates. And when sunlight hits that water, it heats up the water and as it does so, oxygen dissolves or oxygen um, leaves the water and evaporates or goes, returns to gaseous form and goes up in the air. Um, so what happens is you have much less habitability for small fishes and macroinvertebrates and things like that. So having that good mix of, of shade and sunlight is, is healthy for these, these riparian areas and healthy for those streams. Um, it's great for all kinds of wildlife. Uh, riparian areas are great for several different animals. Um, herons, turkeys, just these ones I have list, listed here. A lot of times people don't think of bobwhite quails or bobwhite quail as being, uh, as benefiting from riparian areas. But a lot of times the shrubbery and, and uh, thicker vegetation can provide them uh, cover. Um, in those mixed riparian areas, the grasslands also provide forage area for a lot of these animals. Um, a lot of people don't like snakes. Um, some of our most common snakes that you're going to see around riparian areas and streams are just going to be harmless water snakes, uh, the Nerovia species. Um, you can easily tell these apart from cottonmouths, which everyone's afraid of, by the uh, vertical lines underneath their lower jaw. And they, once you figure that out, they're really easy to tell apart. Um, if you have good streams with lots of fishes in them, you're you're probably going to have a lot of a lot of water snakes. Um, and a lot of thing, and one thing that is very important is um, headwater riparian areas and headwater streams are kind of the breadbasket for larger streams, uh, larger sections of streams downstream. Uh, it's kind of a kind of a difficult concept. It's called a river continuum. Basically, what happens is in these headwater streams, uh, loose coarse particulate matter in the form of leaves and things like that fall off trees, go into these streams, and you have a whole host of small microinvertebrates, insects, and things like that that shred the shred up these leaves, chew them up, eat them, and uh, these contribute to uh, downstream habitat and bigger fishes. Uh, it's also critical for uh, connectivity. So if you have a pasture with no riparian corridor, you have limited connectivity, and this doesn't really support that much wildlife. Whereas if you do have this habitat connectivity, animals can trans, trans, uh, traverse this area, going from one natural area to another or one habitat to another. <clears throat> And uh, so this ability to sustain more populations and, and sustain that connectivity between these populations also increases the overall capacity for wildlife in that area and the, and the diversity. Um, it's also just good for natural beauty and a sense of place, uh, wildlife appreciation and just having a green space um, can even increase land values like we saw in the Clear Creek watershed here in Washington County, Arkansas. Um, uh, it was found that uh, land areas went up when when uh, riparian areas were in, introduced. And there's there are hundreds of, of native plant species you can find in riparian areas. I'd be happy to email this list to anyone if they would just like to know. Uh, we're going to see some pictures of these, so I won't go into that list. You're really going to see uh, things like sycamores, pawpaws, uh, sometimes cottonwoods, black tupelos, um, hackberries, basswood. Uh, American hazelnut, these are going to be some shrubs, uh, viburnums, musclewood, spicebush is really common. 
and then some grass vegetation. This is also very beneficial. And our flowering herbaceous species. And unfortunately, you're also going to see some invasive species in some of these locations. Um, some of our most common ones are going to be, as we talked about earlier, bush honeysuckle. Um, Japanese stilt grass is unfortunately very common in wet areas. So our multiflora rose, Chinese privet, um, perillament, also called beefsteak plant, and uh, Japanese honeysuckle. And uh, the Alliance also maintains a, a list of uh, resources for streamside landowners that I'd be happy to share with anyone. And uh, the Alliance, we can't do this without all of our partners. So we, we enjoy an extensive network of partners. And that's a wrap. So again, my name is Nate Weston. I'm a geospatial ecologist with the Beaver Lake Watershed. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to reach me at this email below. I'd be happy to clarify any of the, <clears throat> or go in detail on any of the topics that I talked about today. Um, Eric, at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand it back over to you. Okay. Thank you, Nate. I really appreciate that. That was a wonderful yeah. presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, great job. A lot of great information. Uh, we appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise with us. Uh, if anyone has any questions, we have uh, a little more than 10 minutes. Um, so feel free to enter them into the chat. I haven't seen any yet. Um, but uh, while we're waiting, uh, I'll go ahead and just say that I want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, <clears throat> just go ahead and give a plug for our next webinar, which will be Wednesday, June 9th, uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. And that's going to be Ryan Denier of Quail Forever speaking about native ecosystem restoration for thriving quail populations. Uh, let's see. Looks like uh, Paula Hickson has uh, said thank you. Uh, she, uh, I guess, enjoyed that presentation, as I know uh, many of us all did. Uh, if you're interested in joining Wildwoods, you can go to wildwoods.org uh, slash membership. And if you want to join the Ozark chapter, you can uh, just select the Ozark chapter as the uh, chapter you would like to join. I believe you do have to choose a chapter when you join. Uh, on our website, ozark.wildwoods.org, you can find back issues of our newsletter along with native plant resources, such as lists of different plants that you could use uh, for various purposes. Uh, you can also uh, request a site uh, visit from uh, someone from our site committee where we can come out if you're a homeowner uh, and advise you on which native species would work well uh, in a, a particular space you're wanting to plant them in. Uh, we also have um, uh, a list of resources of where you can find uh, various native plants, uh, you know, from different, uh, whether it be seeds or potted plants uh, in the Ozark region. Uh, our Facebook page is facebook.com slash Ozark Wild Ones. You can go on there to find out about any other future events and webinars we have coming up. Uh, also, feel free to email me at wildwoodsozarkchapter at gmail.com, uh, and I can make sure that you're on a, a mailing list uh, to receive uh, future information about our future webinars. Uh, looks like uh, we have a few more comments. Uh, Jasmine Dorn also says thank you. Brian Rupar says thanks for the great presentation, Nate. Um, let's see. And Sherry uh, wants you to come out to their farm. So maybe uh, Sherry can reach out to you on um, uh, through your email, uh, which I believe I put there in the chat. So if anybody needs that, um, hey, if you didn't get it from Nate's slides, that is Nate at BeaverWatershedAlliance.org. And Carrie Radloff, she is also another national board member of Wild Ones. It's good to see you here, Carrie. Uh, she said, great information and well presented. Thank you. So it uh, means a lot uh, coming from Carrie. Uh, she's, she's awesome. So um, before we hop off, is there anything else you wanted to convey, Nate? Or is there anything else that uh, anyone else wants to ask or say here? How? Hal has unmuted himself. Yeah, I'd just like to say I went through that pre pretty fast, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to go over anything that you might have questions about. And just to remind everyone, uh, the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel, so if you want to rewatch this uh, presentation, uh, feel free to 
go there. I posted a link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Uh, but if you go to YouTube and type in Wild Ones Ozark Chapter, uh, it should come up in the search box as well. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Again, Nate, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. I know everyone else did, too. Uh, so uh, y'all have a good day.